Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you 24-7, with supplies and solutions for every industry, and access to product specialists ready to help. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hey, what's up, y'all? This is B. Cox from The Vault. Now, have you ever wanted to start your own podcast or you're ready to start one right now, but you're not really sure where to start, what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and what direction to go in? Well, if that's you, look no further. I'm starting a podcast roadmap workshop. Call it the Podcast GPS where you can learn a proven system that will be both effective and efficient. It will take you from that idea of having your own podcast all the way right up to your podcast launch. I know that the system works because it's the same system and roadmap that I use to grow the two podcasts that I produce and host to a combined eight to 10,000 downloads monthly. That's all starting with no equipment, no mega marketing experience, no sponsors, and no corporate machine backing our efforts or bankrolling our operations. It's a six-week course. And at the end of the boot camp, you will have all the following. A proven system for creating and planning episodes. An equipment list that aligns with your capabilities and won't break the bank. You'll understand what an RSS feed is and where to host your podcast. You'll have confidence in your new podcast idea. You'll learn how to record, edit, and add music to your show. And also get a launch roadmap to start distributing your podcast everywhere. And what else do you get? You'll have a proven formula for growth and engagement that led us to our success. You'll know exactly what equipment you need that fits your budget. You'll learn time-saving skills to consistently release episodes and plan ahead. You'll also have live weekly sessions with me and real-time answers to your questions in a hands-on live workshop. And you don't need any technical expertise or recording experience to get started. And to sweeten the deal, I'm throwing in the following bonuses for all podcast GPS enrollees. You'll have access to my royalty-free music library to use within your podcast without worries of copyright claims or expensive lease terms. You'll have my secret episode planning workbook that will help you plan your episodes and set up your recording and production schedule. It makes episode planning super easy. And all course enrollees will be entered into a drawing to win a free USB microphone to get you started. Now, most courses of this caliber are charging thousands of dollars for this content and will get you no closer to starting a podcast than you are right now. But guess what? I'm offering this course at a fraction of the price of those courses. However, I'm only limiting it to 12 open seats, and this course will sell out. Do you want to be left out in the cold or wandering with no idea where to start? If not, you want to act now. And if you're ready to get started and want to start this journey, visit us at vaultclassicpod.com backslash podcast GPS to schedule your free consultation today to talk about starting your journey now. Welcome to the Vault Podcast. Classic music reviews. Presented by IV Creative. Now, here's your hosts, B. Cox and the crew. Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Vault Podcast, Classic Music Reviews. Presented by IV Creative, it's a perspective of the classics from a fresh point of view. We appreciate you for taking your time and lending your ears to our perspective. You could be anywhere listening to anything, but you're right here with us, so we thank you. With you today is yours truly, B. Cox, and I'm rolling solo here today. But shout out to everybody there, especially the crew and especially all the listeners worldwide and stateside for continuing to promote the show and continuing to pass the word. Guys, we are experiencing great numbers here in the beginning of 2022. As we said, we are expecting great things for this year. Got a lot of great things coming up and some great album reviews coming up. So thank you all for continuing to support the show. As you heard in the open of this show, the ad tells you about our private Facebook community that is off and running. That is the Vault Podcast Record Club. You can actually look in the show description and notes here in this episode to get the link to go ahead and join that group. All the listeners out there, if you want to get into the community, talk about some throwback hip hop, R&B and reggae news, and also share some of the records in your collection, the tapes in your collections and the CDs in your collection. Of course, we're also going to be doing some live chats, some exclusives and also some monthly giveaways. So please make sure that you come check us out on the Vault Podcast Record Club. Just answer the questions, agree to the terms and you're in. And also the Buy Me A Coffee where you can directly support the show for the Vault Classic Music Reviews and make sure that we can continue to provide the content so we can keep the vault open for you all and review these classics as the years go by. So thank you again. As we always say here on the vault, our motto is hashtag open the vault, hashtag nothing but the classics. And today we have yet another bonus episode 
relics of the past. And <laughs> I find myself thinking about this topic we're gonna, I'm going to talk about today. You know, it's going to be a quick topic, but thinking about some relics of the past, things that no longer exist when it comes to the music industry, in particular as a fan, when you think about the things that don't exist anymore that are out there that are, you know, long gone, but things that you cherish. So today I'm going to talk about something that <laughs> actually went away as of a few years ago. And it was something that anyone who listened to music and was a music fan from anywhere to the late 80s up until the mid 2010s. This was a staple in our lives, especially if you went out and bought records or you went out and bought tapes or bought CDs that, well, one relic was, of course, of it was the music store. And that was, you know, for those of us out there, depending on where you were, you had your mom and pop shops, you had the local stores that would sell records, tapes and CDs. You had the national chains like the Sam Goodies and the FYEs. And then we had, well, we had in the DC area, nobody beats the whiz. <laughs> you had a waxy maxis, you had tower records, you had even stores like borders and, you know, stores like that would be open. Barnes and Nobles will sell music later on in the late nineties into the two thousands. Of course, some of the big box retail stores, such as your Target, such as your Walmarts. For those of us out there who remember circuit city, shout out to Secret circuit city and best buys later on would uh, buy your music from there as well. And that is a relic of the past that a lot of us somewhat miss, especially now that music has largely gone digital. But what I'm going to talk about today is mostly about record release Tuesdays. Anybody who was a part of the rise of the golden era of hip hop and being a part of the ri the rise of rock music and eventually grunge and metal into what we saw as pop rock. And then what, started to go into what we call the shiny suit era to the commercialization of hip hop heavily to where it became really big worldwide to where it became a phenomenon to the point where we're at now, where now you can go onto apps like Spotify and Apple music and title and so many different other music distributors where you can get your music from nowadays. Back then you had to go and get your source of music by getting it on a physical medium as foreign as it may sound to some people out there. But for those of us who are old enough to remember, this is the way that it was. And starting back at least, we believe, in 1989, when the recording industry decided that there needed to be a standard day when new music, new albums would be released and available for purchase to the public. And that day was on the Tuesdays. And for the longest while, you would always get the promotion coming up about records that were coming out. And... Of course, when new music would come out, those albums would happen. The record industry, different record labels would schedule their releases to come out on those Tuesdays. Now, if there were hot releases, people wanted to go out and get the records and get music on the day that they came out. Folks would go to the record store, to the music store, would go and buy the albums, would then go and play it. And for a lot of us in my era, that was getting the tapes and putting them in the tape decks in the car. Or if you had a CD player which for a lot of people in the early parts of my youth, it was getting the disc man with the tape adapter. <laughs> Shout out to the Sony disc man and, um, and taping it either to the dash or the center console. And then later on when they started developing cars with the CD players in them, then it was just popping the CD in and letting it ride. So that was a big part of the music industry and also a big part of fanhood. Now <laughs> the way that it used to be back in the day, and for those of us who all remember is that record labels had to spend money on marketing to be able to get the word out about the albums that are coming out. Now, usually they would release singles for these albums and the development of an album all really was based around, okay, what's the singles are going to be? What is the rollout of this single? Getting that single out to radio stations across the nation. And this would be certain markets would get the song sooner than others. And you would always have to work on the promotional tours, like having phone interviews and doing promotional tours around the country to promote this single that would eventually also end up promoting your album. And we would see like the song on the radio or the, even sometimes you would even see the video before you actually heard the song on the radio sometimes. And that what that did was build the anticipation, especially if it was a really, really hot single that things were on the way. Now, a lot of the ways that I heard about music coming out were a couple of ways. One was, of course, reading the magazines. 
Now, with the source, the source was, of course, a treasure trove of information. It wasn't just the articles that had the interviews with the artists that were getting ready to release music, the features that they had there. It was also the ads you saw as you flipped through the pages of the magazine, those full page ads, which I couldn't even imagine back then how much those ads cost. And a magazine like the source, which at that time was the hip hop Bible or the quarter page ads that you would see sometimes. The, and then as you got further back towards the record report, and as you got to those notable quotable pages, and then you start to see like, you know, the other fashion brands being advertised, you would see stuff, of course, like Pelly Pelly, stuff like P&B, things like uh, at that point, Fat Farm, and uh, later on would be stuff like Sean John and Rock Aware and, you know, all those hip hop based brands, FUBU would all be there. You would run into a section somewhere in the source and other magazines where you saw there was new music coming out. And if they had committed to an actual record release date, you would see the date when that was, when those records would come out. Now about 80% of the time, 85% of the time they would stick to those release dates. And if the album was ever pushed back, we never really heard about it immediately in real time. It was always after the fact, you know, sometimes you would go to a record store and the album wouldn't be there. And because we didn't get out information in real time like we do now. Sometimes we would hear it maybe a couple of days or a week or so, or maybe the month afterwards that had been pushed back a few months. And that happened to a couple of different albums. As a matter of fact, the way things happened back then is that I could remember reading in the source that there was a title for the, an album for artists that they were putting out, and then the title would change. One particular album that I can remember that was in the source, an album we'll be covering this year in 1997, Jay-Z, In My Lifetime, Volume 1, they had publicized, I believe, in one issue of the source as the name of the album will be Heir to the Throne. And it turned out to be In My Lifetime, Volume 1 instead. P. Diddy, also in 1997, the album that, that we now know was One Way Out was originally supposed to be called Hell Up in Harlem. And the title obviously changed as well. Things change. You know, when you roll things out, sometimes back then you had to switch on the fly and, you know, sometimes it's good for business, sometimes it's not. But either way, we went by those on the release dates. But the more frequent way that we heard about record releases back then was by listening to the promos that ran on the radio. It would be a mixture of pre-recorded promos that would be, you know, recorded professionally with a preview of the single or a couple of singles and then also give a rundown of who the featured artist on that would be, on the album would be if there are any and then it would give you a date when it was coming out and the record label that it was coming out on. We would also see this in the form of also promo spots on television. You would see it, I would say, more prominently on the box, the music television you control, the video jukebox, that the national one that everybody used to see, where we would see these promos in between videos of these albums that were coming out and a date also as well. And you would, you know, of course, same thing that you're talking about, you hear on the radio, but visually you would see the names pop up of the featured artists, the singles, the date that it's dropping. And it always, you know, stuck in your head. And that's why record labels spent so much money on marketing because you want people to be there when the product drops. And the opening day and opening week, the sales for that product would be so critical because when the charts came out, people saw which were the best selling albums on that chart. And for people who weren't the early record release Tuesday folks that would go and get them, everybody else would kind of looked at and, you know, wait and see. And then maybe they would go out and go what, get the album. But as the numbers came out that first week, it's really when people started to look and be like, wow, damn, this shit really is a hit. It must be a hit. And in most cases, usually when you had a, a big seller, it usually would be. And But the big tell would always also be the second week out sales of the album. Because if they were somewhat close to the first weeks or if they dropped significantly, then that would always, you would always rely on the word of somebody else. If you didn't have the album to tell you whether or not you wanted to go out and go get it. So if the sales, the second week were respectable, then the word was starting to get out that the album was hot. If it wasn't, then the word probably started getting out that the album wasn't as hot. So the drop in those second weeks, third weeks of sales, you know, could be telling a lot about the public's perception of what the album was. So to record release Tuesdays. Now, everybody has their personal stories of what they went through when they had their record release Tuesdays. And I had just a couple of myself. Now, I started buying albums, I would say, probably around the end of 1995, beginning of 1996, with some of the money that I was getting from 
the work that I was doing at that particular time. Sometimes it was, you know, cutting grass. Sometimes it was shoveling snow. Now, in 96, we had a huge snowstorm for those of us on the East Coast, if you remember it. I mean, obviously, if you were of age, everybody remembers the blizzard of 96. So I had a lot of snow shoveling money that I made during those two weeks. Me and my friend, my boy Chris Child, shout out to In Your Face, DJ In Your Face, my man, the guy who actually inspired me to want to become an MC and actually get involved in the making of hip hop music first when I was just a fan. But I would take some of that money and I would go and buy an album whenever I saw something that I wanted. In particular, I remember during that time in 96, uh, I was really juiced about the Busta Rhymes album, The Coming, that was coming out. So that was an album that I spent my money on. Um, I didn't necessarily go out on that Tuesday and got it, but I think I got it like either that first or that second week later on. Another album that I was used to go out to go get was Nas. It was written, Trap Called Quest, Beach Rhymes and Life. Uh, later on that year, Mob Deep, Hell on Earth, um, Red Man's Muddy Waters. Um, as we went into 1997, a really big album came across on my radar, and that was Biggie's Life After Death. So that was the first album that I think I stood in line at the record store waiting to buy an album. I never really stood in a really long line to go get an album. But I think that that was the first time that I spent time waiting in a long line. Like I think I got the, got the double CD and I waited in line for probably, I don't know, maybe about 30 to 45 minutes. But I was determined to get it because of the circumstances around the record release and this being Biggie's album, he had just been shot and killed two weeks earlier it was highly anticipated for a lot of people to go listen to this album because it was Biggie and Biggie was no longer with us. And this was an album that was aptly titled life after death, which was determined before he died, obviously, but since the fact he was killed added even more intrigue to it. So I stood in line for about 30 to 45 minutes and my record store, the one that I bought the majority of my music from when I lived in my neighborhood in Prince George's County in Maryland was the Circuit City in Landover, Maryland, across the street from Landover Mall, and right not too far down the street from what will become uh, what is now FedEx Field, the home of the now Washington football team, but was then the Washington Redskins. And that was the sh store we used to go to because my sister would drive there to go get her music from Circuit City. And the reason why we went there and didn't necessarily go to the Waxy Maxies or Sam Goodies and Landover Mall because you could always get decent prices at Circuit City, and also the lines would be a little bit shorter because Circuit City was sort of like the Best Buy before it was Best Buy. And that's where you went to go get all kind of electronics. And, you know, there were you can get keyboards and, of course, speakers there and computer equipment and wires and cables and, you know, all types of electronics that you could get at Circuit City. But they had a pretty extensive music se section with tapes and CDs. So I can remember standing in the line at Circuit City with Life After Death, death and waiting 30 to 45 minutes. And... It wasn't even close. Everybody who was in line had that double CD. How I they kept getting the boxes out to keep restocking those shelves with the Life After Death double CD, I don't know how. Because there had to be, I would say, in that store with the line stretching all the way past electronics where the headphones and all the audio cables and aux cables and everything else back past to where the... VCRs and you know what was <laughs> all these other different types of like you know media players and everything else the keyboards it had to be probably anywhere between like 60 people to 70 people in line and all of them I would say had the biggie CD and that's sort of like here like talking about like you know that the anticipation that people are getting as they're getting ready to go to the register that really to me captured the essence of record release Tuesday more than anything else it was if you had a hot release and if that hot release was coming out and especially if it was something that was really, really greatly anticipated by the public and was, was a huge hype. Sometimes the record stores would open their doors at 12 midnight when the album was coming out. And there would be times when people would line up outside of the store sometimes, whether it was at 12 midnight or if they would open up at eight, nine o'clock in the morning where the lines would be waiting outside of the record store for folks to get into the store to buy the album. Everybody wanted to make sure they got there that first day. Let's make sure that you had it on the first day for a lot of people. What's a big deal. And then let's not even talk about the record stores in New York and places like New York and LA where you would have the fresh release. And then an artist would be there to sign a copy of the album. Then you got the line is twice or three times as long as it normally would be because they get a chance to meet the artist briefly, be able to get the copy signed. And in some cases, maybe even take pictures was a huge deal. And 
you know, that anticipation where you're sort of sitting in line, you got people like conversations that you hear. People will say, oh, we're looking at the, you're looking at the back track listing and looking at it. Oh, on the back of this and the Biggie album. Oh, it's a track with R. Kelly. He's got another track with Jay-Z. Oh, he's got it. Bone Thugs and Harmony. You know, people start thinking like, well, you know, I really want to make sure I listen to this. Or I want to make sure that I hear this track or, you know, what do you think the production is going to be like? Or, oh, man, this is crazy. The Biggie's no longer here. And, yo, you think this has got a chance to be better than Life After Death? You hear those conversations and the people, whether you're alone or it's people with you, and then you sort of have people in the line with you, then folks sort of hear each other's conversations. You strike up conversations with people that takes you all the way through the line. Then that 30 to 45 minutes in some cases, if it's a long line, doesn't seem as long because the excitement sort of everybody fed off of everyone else's excitement and energy. You know, that's really what I could say about record release Tuesdays is that the energy that you had in the record store through everyone wanting to go and get new music was really something that I can't describe. It was, um, it was electric to probably to say best. And if it was a really, really hot album, it would be something that'd be like, wow, like this is crazy. Another record release that I can remember like really vividly was also DMX's. And then there was X in 1999. And, uh, I remember being in the line once again at circuit city and I remember seeing a couple of people from school and I was a senior in high school that year. So I went ahead and took myself out of school and went to go get the, and then there was X album, you know, the, the anticipation with that and us wanting to see like at this point X had put out three albums in the course of just about just under about, let's say 18, 19 months or so. And we knew that he was hitting on every single album that he had put out. The third one that I can really remember was uh, like Water for Chocolate for Common. And for me, uh, after listening to One Day, it all makes sense. And then hearing songs like The Sixth Sense and hearing doing it, I was amped to be able to hear another Common album to understand he was working with DJ Premier and then also with Questlove and then Jay Dilla. So I stood in line waiting for that like Water for Chocolate. And I remember the line for that was considerably long because there was a lot of hip hop heads who you know, we're looking for that album as well that day. And to talk about also the crowds on record release Tuesdays is really interesting because you would always see the gamut of people that would be in the line. You know, you'd have the the regular folks, the folks who were sort of there because their friends are there. You would have the hip hop heads, you know, the ones that would have on the the Rasta man caps or the Koofies and, you know, the, (laughs) you know, all types of stuff, you know, dressed like, you know, really the gamut of people from the underground hip hop heads to the get wits to the pop stars to, you know, the fashionistas, you would see all types of people there going to buy records. It really was a mixture of the different types of people from all types of life, all different types of races as well. So it was never really just a bunch of black people, even when growing up in Prince George's County, which was and still is a predominantly black county, you would see a vast majority of different types of people there to go and buy music at record release Tuesdays. And then by the time you got into school on Wednesdays, when you had played the album, you would get people sitting there talking about some, yo, have you heard this? Have you heard that? And at my crew, as I always like to talk about the lunch table, which served as the inspiration for the vault podcast, classic music reviews, was, you know, the talk about the albums that came out. And for us, it was like, yo, pulling out those albums and going over the track listing and being like, yo, let's talk about these tracks. And that was a big part of life in, in high school. It was music. It was what you're listening to in the morning, what you listen to at lunch and talk about at lunch and what you're listening to on the bus rides to school and then on, on the way back home from school, you know. And to take it back to Biggie's Life After Death is that Wednesday – after the album came out, it seemed like everybody in school had it. Even the people that I didn't even think liked New York rap and liked Biggie like that, everybody had it. So um, one of the most popular questions you get during the day would be, well, what are you listening to? What are you listening to? That wasn't the question on that Wednesday after Life After Death came out. The question is, what track are you listening to? Because everybody knew what we were listening to at school. It was just like, what disc are you listening to? One or two, what track are you listening to? And to go through the different conversations you heard that day of people saying, oh, I'm on disc number two, I'm listening to The World is Filled, or I'm listening to My Downfall, or I'm listening to Long Kiss Goodnight, or I'm on disc one, I'm listening to What's Beef, or listening to More Money, More Problems, or Niggas Bleed, and the conversations around what everybody's favorite track was, 
that's what made conversations about music really interesting because the presence of physical media of music, you know, having something in your hand and putting it in that tape deck or in that Walkman or putting it in that disc man, you know, and being able to listen to it. And my homeboy on the bus, my boy CJ would always also have a couple of speakers on there where we could play the music out loud. And our bus driver was actually cool about it as long as the music wasn't too loud and didn't distract her. So we used to love playing music and folks would sit there and be like, yo, turn that joint up, turn it up. That was one of the big things about having physical media. And I know it sounds corny and it sounds like a little, for those of you out there who have known mostly the streaming age and digital age and being able to go on YouTube and pull up music and go to Apple music and iTunes and pull up music. It sounds a little corny because you could do that now. I mean, we got phones that can play through Bluetooth through car speakers. We got the Bluetooth uh, speakers that we can put in that you could put in your shower or put on your deck or put on your kitchen table. Being able to play music now loudly is not a new thing. I mean, we've been doing it for a while. I just can't really explain what it meant to be able to have that piece of music that you could keep with you forever. And to be able to have that tape, that CD, that disc, and be able to go out on record release Tuesday, to know that on Monday night or Tuesday while you were getting ready to come home from school or get off of work or do whatever, to know that you were headed to the record store to go get that piece of music that you coveted so much and how much it meant for them, you to be able to get it, to see whether or not reality and expectations met each other right in the middle. And if they did, then great. Then if not, you were a little bit disappointed. But nevertheless, though, the journey for Record Release Tuesdays was really, really big. Now, right around 2015, they uh, the industry made a change and decided that the records and albums and new music would not drop on Tuesdays anymore. They would now start right around July 10th, 2015, that they were being released on Fridays. So I had that conversation for the longest while. Like, when in the hell did they stop releasing albums on Tuesday? Now albums are coming out on Fridays. Well, it was decided, you know, especially in the digital age and with the album sales starting to go down and people weren't going into the stores to buy physical copies of CDs anymore and it was more about streaming and buying them on iTunes and buying them on Tidal and buying them on all these different other music platforms where you can consume music digitally rather than actually physically that, you know, hey, we don't need to go ahead and release them on Tuesdays anymore. Plus, data was starting to be released to say that consumers across a number of different countries around the world, the biggest consumers said they, they would like to get their new music on Friday or Saturday versus having that come out on Tuesday. And uh, that sort of makes sense. Cause I do know a lot of people who didn't go out and get their music on those record release Tuesdays, but would go and get them on Friday or Saturday as they were off of work or off from school. And they could actually go around and do things. And that would be one of their stops would be to the music store. So record release Tuesdays are no more. And have been that way for about close to seven years now coming up this summer. But to those of us who were around from the late eighties into the mid 2010s, that record release Tuesdays was a magical, magical time. And it's something for most of us, we won't forget it. And we'll talk about it. It'll be one of those things that all of us will talk about. Things that we remembered. Yes, another relic of the past. So rest in peace to record release Tuesdays. What a joy you brought to so many of our lives. And that is going to wrap up yet another edition of The Vault. Please make sure you are checking us out on our host on Red Circle. You can also go to our website, vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com. Of course, you can check out all of our episodes on that website. Also, all of our album reviews. You can leave a review on every one of our episodes there on the site. It also takes you to all of our streaming sources, as well as all of our social media channels. Again, you can reach us on social media on at vaultclassicpod on Instagram on Twitter at Vault Classic and on Facebook and YouTube, the Vault Classic Music Reviews Podcast. Search there. You'll find us. Subscribe, like the page. Of course, we have our private Facebook community, the Vault Podcast Record Club. Check the show description and notes. You can see it there. Click on the link. Answer a few questions and you're in. We're going to have a lot of great things coming up this year, so please make sure you join. And of course, make sure that you support us on Buy Me A Coffee. You can get it to our Buy Me A Coffee link in our show description and notes as well, but also on vaultclassicpod.com com in the bottom left hand corner you click on the coffee cup icon that takes you straight to our buy me a coffee page you can go there contribute to the show go ahead and support us and make sure that we can keep continuing to produce content that makes sure that we will always open the vault we appreciate the support and if you have a friend tell a friend and make sure that, that friend tells a friend always remember to keep your headphones on your music loud but not too loud and as we close we like to remind everyone to dream big because dreams are the basis for creation always create Motivate, 
and elevate because you were never destined or created to stay stationary in this life. And on that note, we say peace. Thank you for listening and coming into The Vault. Please subscribe and visit us at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com.